Absolutely. And if it's okay with you, I will go ahead and share my screen as well. Sure. All right. And can you see my screen right now? Yes. Okay, good. Well, I am Beth Schistel, brand with Crystal, and I am the HR manager with the Excelsior Group. Uh, we are a boutique real estate firm local to the Twin Cities market that we do have one location down in Rochester. Um, and Excelsior in Latin means ever upward, which is something that we're constantly striving for. Um, we often have open positions in a variety of roles, but in particular with our multifamily affiliate. And we've been wanting to build relationships and connections with the veteran community for some time now. So I'm super thankful to have been connected with the Eagle Loop and all of you. Um, I, apparently we have some one of your members who now is one of our employees and it was through legal group that we ultimately found each other. Um, so it's, it's a small world sometimes and I'm really glad to be able to be here and to share a little bit about what I know um, in connecting with Randall and with Alan. Um, we're talking about different ideas on what might be helpful. And so what I'm going to be talking about today is about bringing your A game. So with many of you being job seekers or knowing someone who is, a question I hear fairly often is, how do I break into blank? You know, name your industry or the type of position that, that might be. It can be difficult and frustrating when you're trying to get from here to there, as this comic illustrates. And I'm just hoping that that becomes just a little bit easier with a few tips from me. So when I talk about bringing your A game, it's to me a matter of being prepared. And a lot of it is that front end. What do you wanna do before you make it all the way into the process of the interview? It's rare when a great opportunity just falls into our lap. So to me, it really comes down to thoughtful, hard work and beginning with knowing yourself and truly reviewing the job opportunity that might be before you. Well, what does that look like? You know you, you know what you can do, you know um, what you're about and what you might have to offer. So it's an opportunity to really identify your knowledge, your skills, and your abilities. We call those KSAs, knowledge, skills, and abilities. And I'm hoping that many of you already have a resume or a starting point that you're kicking off with. And so the question is, you know, do you have something on there already that maybe we want to unpack further? It's important when you're doing your resume to be thinking about your word choices, what they mean, and what they ultimately say about you. So I'm going to give you a moment to read this comic. So in this example, uh, this is a Dilbert comic. Uh, Pointy-haired boss says that he hires someone who was driven, and evidently his definition of driven was a little different than the person he hired. Um, Pointy-haired boss, of course, thinking that he was driven, meaning motivated, and the reality is means that you know he might have been waiting to get driven by a, you know, a chauffeur, a shuttle, a bus, and taking him to work. So um, it's important that we're very clear in as we talk about who we are and what we're doing to. Um, add some context, add some color to what it is. So, I mean, this is a cartoon, um, but there's room for misinterpretation in a lot of the things that we say and a lot of the things that we do. And we really wanna make sure that we're communicating who you are so that those hiring managers have something to draw on and really get a sense of that before you even get a chance to meet them. So let's not leave it to guessing. Um, mean what you say and say what you mean, be concise and then also be thorough. From there, you may have a natural draw towards certain positions. And so it's about clearly reading through what is posted and figuring out what a job company or job or a company is asking for. Um, many companies post a qualification section. They might post part of the job description and then there they might have that specific qualification section. And really that's about those KSAs, those knowledge, skills, and abilities. It's usually the baseline, the bare bones of what they need. If they say preferred, well, then you know that's the extra. It's not the requirement, but the rest of it really is a requirement or it, it generally is listed in such a way. And so um, if it's not really descriptive, it just might require a little bit of extra digging or research to figure out what truly are they looking for in case the ad is more of a, a sales pitch than a, a job description. 
uh, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll find people who are looking at social media posting or we'll actually go to the company's website to dig into and figure out what is you know, X, Y, Z position and what does that actually look like so that you know what those KSAs are in case they're not already explicitly out there for you. And to me, those are a lot of the pieces that we want to pay special attention to. Um, a lot of time can be um, with those is focused on the, the hard skills, the technical skills, things like you know, intermediate Excel skills or um, must have exposure to XYZ system. Um, those are things that are often taught and the rest are going to be those soft skills. Things are more innate that are harder to come by. Many of them can be taught, but it, it takes a lot more effort and, and time than, than some of those hard skills can be. So one example of a soft skill that I want to talk and unpack a little bit with you today is um, just an example, um, but the ability to effectively communicate with internal and external customers. And so we'll get into a little bit about what that might look like here. So here at the Excelsior Group, we hire a lot of leasing consultants who ultimately are in a sales position. They're showcasing our apartment complexes, our single family home rentals, and then all the amenities that go into those spaces. A leasing consultant needs to be a strong communicator. So here I put up a, just a generic KSA, the ability to communicate effectively with internal and external customers. You think that it seems fairly clear, and it is, but it might not always really pull out some of the things that you might be looking for and knowing that do I need that and fulfill that requirement that they're asking. So let's unpack it, break it down. What is it being asked? So it could be a number of things, but off the top of my head, when I read something like that, the way I internalize it and interpret that could mean things like written and verbal skills. Do they have strong email etiquette? Are they good on the phone? Are they good naturally speaking to somebody? Do they have a good cadence with their voice? Are they welcoming in, in the way that they speak? Do they have strong customer service skills? Um, are they an active listener? Or are they constantly interrupting other people? You know, what does that look like? Patience, a lot of times our communication comes down to patience. Um, teamwork, you're probably working with other people and being able to have some give and some take with that. And then I also think about the attitude that somebody might come into communicating with. And uh, I think the best communicators are those that have that positive attitude. <clears throat> so when you read that KSA, you might have come up with you know, more ideas or fewer ideas or maybe completely different ideas than, than what I have. But that's the challenge for you is when you read one of these KSAs on a job description, really think about what does that mean? What exactly are they looking for? and then taking that time to reflect on what you might have to offer. And that's where we jump into the comparison of transferable skills. So what does that job have? What are your skills? And making sure that there is going to be that, that fit, that connection, and we'll draw on that in a moment. So we'll go back to our example here, um, the ability to communicate effectively with internal and external customers. So we have this requirement and we have some ideas on what it might mean, but let's say that you have prior experience as a cashier. Just a generic example here. Thinking about that experience, I imagine that some of the same attributes might come up. When you're a cashier, you probably have to have a good attitude. You never know who's going to come across your lane and what their day is like, what you might, how they might respond to you. I'm um, guessing there's going to be an element of having worked together as a team. You probably have other people who rely on you to communicate effectively to them, give them updates about where things are at, if they're needed, if there's a lane that's getting backed up and you need to call them to the front. Um, so there's that element of teamwork there. And you have to listen to a lot of stories, I imagine. Um, there's just different needs that people will have who are coming through or that you're working with. And of course, you want to be able to contribute and make it a, a great experience, right, for that customer who is going through your lane. And those are all transferable skills. Um, I think it's important to know that whatever your background, whatever your history, whatever your experiences, there are transferable skills. And I think sometimes people get it got, caught up in thinking that, well, I just did X, Y, Z. I don't have something that will translate. And, and I assure you that there's always something, but it's, it's about the unpacking. It's about trying to figure out what are those things that 
I can take from that experience and draw on, and then I can move over into that next opportunity. Other examples, um, are you good with hands? Your hands fixing things, solving things, you know, tinkering around. You might be able to apply those skills in a number of ways. Where else can you transfer that to? For example, at the Excelsior Group, we hire a lot of maintenance technicians, and they may not have direct experience with the multifamily housing industry, but they might be a really good handyman or a mechanic or just generally have a hobby of fixing things. And those are things that you can promote and that you can draw upon and utilize as you explore that next opportunity. If you maybe have good business skills, um, maybe a mind for math and numbers, data analytics, tracking things, making sense of a lot of that, those types of skills can transfer to any type of office environment. But as I think about the Excelsior Group, we have property accountants, assistant managers, where those skills in particular are really helpful. And maybe it's not an apples to apples comparison of the job, but it could be an apples to apples of the skills and those KSAs that we might be able to draw upon. Maybe you just have natural good leader tendencies. Um, maybe you've been able to demonstrate that you have an ability to motivate others, be a really good resource for them, create that really wonderful team environment to give direction to them. Um, and making it a, a really wonderful place to be. And those are things that are transferable. So what do you have that we can draw on and, and really translate that to some upcoming goals? It might be helpful. I know sometimes we, we might not necessarily know how to get to that A to B, that from here to there, as we <laughs> saw in that first comic. And so even just talking about it with somebody, explaining your story in, in detail. Yes, you have those technical hard skills of my job might have been X, Y, and Z, but let's discuss what did that really look like? How did you do that? In what ways, what manners um, did you have in order to accomplish those different things? Because those are the transferable skills that are probably going to then benefit you as you look to that next goal. Um, then we wanna move on to highlighting the match. So once you've identified your own skills, you reviewed that job opportunity, you made that transferable skills comparison, it's time to highlight the match for that prospective employer. So I'm a bit old fashioned here, but I'll tell you something that I really look for and that is meaningful to me as I'm looking at resumes. And that's a cover letter. And generally when I say that, I get a lot of groans and mumbling and people just up in the air. Those are, you know, we don't do those anymore, but I'm here to tell you that it's meaningful and impactful to some of us, to me especially. So what I want to see and why it's important is that to me, it's about somebody taking that extra step. It's about putting your best foot forward in this interviewing process. It's about distinguishing yourself. And to me, the cover letter is that real opportunity to be able to do those different things and to showcase who they are, maybe something that I might have missed in the resume and ultimately explain to me why I should hire them. One of the core values we have here at the Excelsior Group is initiative. And to me, a cover letter, it could be a clear demonstration of that, especially since it's not a common thing to do anymore. To me, um, taking the initiative is about going that extra mile, about doing something that maybe isn't necessarily expected of you. It's putting in the effort that somebody else might not. And to me, again, that's where that cover letter might come in. Somebody who demonstrates that is, is who we'd want to hire at the Excelsior Group. And ultimately, if, if I have two candidates and they're otherwise identical, let's say, with education and work experiences and their overall demeanor and disposition, and one of them did the cover letter and the other didn't, I think the one who did the cover letter is definitely going to get my vote. Um, that's really a distinguishing factor for me and something I encourage you to think about. Um, it does require a little bit more effort. It requires personalized care. It might be, you know, putting together some extra details and uncovering the company that you might be looking for. What are their core values or what's meaningful to them? What did they put in the job description that stood out to you? And thinking about how you might craft a message about that. Uh, sometimes I hear applicants are just put off by the idea of a couple other because they think it has to be some elaborate novel that they're writing. And I'm here to tell you it doesn't have to be. 
Um, I, as a recruiter, am often very satisfied, one, that somebody has taken the effort to put one together, but two, it can just be a very short couple of sentences, maybe a paragraph or two. It's about telling a story. It's about filling in the gaps, because as good as a resume might be, sometimes it's not everything. There might be pieces in there that are missing or that really don't tell who you are or what you have to offer. And that cover letter to me is the opportunity to say, okay, I may not have exactly what you're looking for, or I may not have been that exact apples to apples position in the past, but here's what I can offer. Here's what I know. Here's what I can do best. Here's what you're going to, to see as if you hire me and what I can offer you. So taking just a little bit of extra time to do that, maybe have a template of some core things that you want to demonstrate and talk about no matter what position or what company, and then you can tweak it just a little bit if necessary or, or not. But I think just the fact that you have something to showcase who you are beyond a resume can be really impactful, especially to someone like me. Um, this is a great opportunity as well to highlight that you are a vet uh, or that you have those vet connections. Your resume probably also says that, but you can really explain more about your story and drawing on those soft skills that we talked about um, that may not always be as evident on, on just your resume. So here's that opportunity for you to do that. Um, when I see that somebody is a vet, I get excited. Um, I think there's a lot of really wonderful characteristics that are particular to the veteran population. And it usually will give me pause if I see that on a resume. But what I love more is seeing that in the cover letter and seeing an additional explanation about that experience or um, some things that they might be able to apply. Um, this is probably cliche, but um, years ago, I worked more in a production type environment as a recruiter and attendance was absolutely critical. They had quotas to meet and they had a lot of work that had to be done at a very early hour. And it wasn't something that everybody could do. I mean, the shift started at 5.30 and I can tell you I'm sleeping at 5.30. So, to find somebody who was committed and dedicated and respectful of that time commitment, it was just amazing. And we found that we had a lot of vets in that role who were perfect for it because they honored that more than maybe your average civilian would. So I think there's a lot of things as simple as attendance that are really impactful that a lot of employers frankly struggle with because we're not finding the right people who, who have that respect for, for doing some of those things. Uh, we also just had yesterday, on Monday, we had a, a new vet, uh, he's an army vet, start with us uh, as one of our maintenance technicians. And he, in his cover letter, he mentioned that he was a vet. And so he just talked very briefly, a sentence or two or so, um, about where he was and what he did. And it was, um, he had a little bit more of a hands-on role. So he just mentioned that, that it was hands-on. And that's perfect for us knowing that he was looking to be a maintenance technician. And um, you know, we might not always speak the language of, of veterans and veterans might not always speak the full language of, of a civilian, but I think there are so many transferable things and it's about partnering together and finding those things, those transferable skills and how we can get those pieces to connect. Um, and that's what he did. He did that in his cover letter and it was really great and exciting to be able to see that connection that he was able to make and, and help us help him in the end. You know, as you think about prep work and you know, this is really the, the pre of the interviewing process, but um, I just encourage you to take some of that time to process through what transferable skills could look like. Um, hoping that maybe just some of the few things I shared today might be a, a kickoff for you or get you started thinking about things a little bit differently or things that you might be able to tweak and be able to hone in on as you continue to explore different things and get you where it is that you want to go. Um, I know, you know some of you might have some questions, and so if you're interested in connecting, uh, maybe in one-on-one -on -one or even as part of this session today, I'm certainly glad to do that. We'd love to continue building our relationship with all of you as part of the Eagle group. Um, so let me know if that's something you're interested in. I just put up my contact information, so please take that down and keep it in your back pocket and pull it out if you're ever interested in, you know, whether about the topic today, about transferable skills, about anything related to the resume process, interviewing, um, I'm glad to do a resource for you or another resource for you um, just to get that another perspective. I know that can be good just to hear different ways of, 
how the different companies might come together on, on a particular topic. Um, but I also just generally love the power of networking and uh, they have this really wonderful community of veterans and veteran families. And so if I may, I'd like to ask that if you know of somebody who might be looking for an opportunity that might be interested potentially in joining the real estate, the multifamily housing industry, um, I'd love for you to forward my information onto them and see if we might be able to make some connections that way. I think it's really exciting to be able to do those things. And I love that the Eagle Group has already been able to help us bring in an excellent hire as um, we have an assistant manager who um, is within that power of networking. So please feel free to share my information if you think there might be anybody who would be interested. Are there any, that's all I have. Um, if there, there's any questions, I'm glad to take some of those now. Yeah. Yeah, there's a few in the chat if you want to look in there too, Beth, to get started. Sure, let me see if I can find that. <laughs> I'm just going to end this slideshow real quick to help me find the chat. It's along the bottom of the Zoom screen. I think I've got to get my screen a little bit bigger. It's my, my first time being really in a, a full Zoom. Well, um, while you're doing that, it seemed like there was a lot of questions around cover letters, uh, you know, what form, format, what goes in them, um, is there any templates or styles or things that are particular of interest to you particularly? So if you want to maybe start there. Yeah, so with cover letters, I think they can be pretty simple. I, I wouldn't say they have to be anything big. In fact, you know, you could write it as your typical business letter where you've got the date up top and you know to whom it may concern or if you have somebody's name and what it's about and, and, and diving into what your introduction is but by no means is that required in fact I mentioned the vet that just started with us this um, yesterday and his was very simple it was just uh, you know dear hiring manager I'm really interested in this particular opportunity I think it's an, a place where you can highlight maybe where you've heard about the opportunity why you're interested in it there's something that stood out about it um, and then, then that's where you have a chance to go, okay, I'm interested in this because of X, Y, Z, because I'm really good with my hands, because I'm really good with customer service, because I've always had a passion for real estate and I want to dive in and learn more about this, or I love accounting and this position as I read through it, it got me really excited for these different reasons, or I've heard about you, or, you know, whatever that, that is. Um, maybe you're wanting to work at a bank where you could talk about that. I've worked with, you know, U.S. Bank, or I've had a U.S. Bank account for the last 20 years and it's been a great experience and I want to contribute to something like that. Um, it can be so generic, it could be robust. I think the point is that you do something, that you write and something that is um, meaningful and personal to you. Um, again, it doesn't have to be a novel. It could be just a few sentences, a few paragraphs explaining that you are interested and that you it's that chance to highlight that you're interested, that you know, communicate your passion for that role and why you think you might be that fit, what you can offer about it. Does that help provide a little bit of context and clarity about it? That is good. So provide the why behind the application. Yeah, exactly. Very cool. Thank you. That's a good perspective. And I'm sorry, I still don't not able to find where my so if you pull up your Zoom window, the Zoom application, there should be along the bottom a, a green share screen button or at the top, maybe you should be able to turn off screen share. Oh, yeah. Ellen, I'll just ask my question. Um, I'll find that. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Okay, I'm I've had trouble with my... Uh, my that sounds speaker. much better. Um, I'm an employment specialist with the Minnesota Assistance Council for Veterans, and um, my question was that um, previously they've talked about cover letters to talk about how you would fit with the company, but I know that lately they've done cover letters to talk about how um, the company kind of fits with you or the interests of the company itself. Um, more about the company and less about the person. What do you look for? That's interesting. I mean, I think it's helpful to certainly talk about the company and what it is that's appealing about them. Um, in my own cover letter, what I've done in the past is I start out with my intro 
um, you know, where I found the opportunity about the position. And then for me, and, and for the Excelsior group, our core values are really important. And it's some of those soft skills that not everybody has. And so for me, it's always really important to, to zero in, okay, what, what are your core values and how does that align with my core values? And so I really try to make that connection first and foremost, because it's about them and it's about me. It's, it's kind of that win-win, it's that combination of what we can do together and why it's a fit, even taking the position out because maybe that position comes and maybe that position goes. Maybe there's something else that I'm a better fit for. Maybe there's um, a different role that makes sense for me. And, and sometimes as an applicant, you might not necessarily know what all those rules are, but you know that if a company is a good fit for you, that you want to be part of that company. And so that's the approach that I personally have taken is I found a company that I want to work for and I'm open to those opportunities. So maybe it's less position specific and more about that particular company um, and zeroing in on who they are and why I want to be part of their company and talking about them, how I, I can fit what it is they're looking for. So with the Excelsior group, we have six core values and it's, we, we post it on our careers page and we get very known. And in fact, as part of our application process, we want people, we want applicants to write in what our six core values are because it's so important to us. We want them to recognize that at the very front end. And so then if somebody pulls that into a cover letter, that's appealing to me because it shows that they're actually paying attention. They understand that the core values are really important to us and they're making the connection that the person the personal side, those personal attributes, the soft skills that somebody has are a foundation for us. Now, not every company is like that. I mean, I imagine, you know, big corporations, they probably don't care quite as much as those things, but we're a small company. We're only at about 160 employees. And so you know people and you want to be able to work with people who share your core values um, because you're seeing them so much day to day. Um, so I think to answer your question, it's, I think it makes sense to talk more about the company, but ultimately it's your story and your way to convince and showcase and use it as that sales pitch before you have a chance to really make a sales pitch in the interview. It's your chance to show who you are, what you're about, why you're that person for that right for that job, and then get that interview where you can talk more about it. And so I did get my, my uh, chat feed up, so I'm, I'm looking through that real quick. And so there was the question about, yeah. does anybody read the cover letters? And I, I think that's a very fair question. It's a good question and not everybody does. I tell you that I do. In fact, I start at the cover letter. I don't even look at the resume until I've seen the cover letter. Um, we have a number of positions where written communication is really important. And so we made a requirement for some of those positions. For example, on my HR team, anybody that wants to be part of the HR team, I've hired a handful of ladies and that was a requirement because we do so much email communication. We do a lot of verbal communication with employees, with applicants, to communities, um, community organizations like yours. We, we do so much communication that I need to know that somebody has a strong ability to do that and that they're taking that step that I'm asking them to do. If they're not going to do the bare bones of doing a cover letter, if I'm asking them to do one, then what confidence do I have that they're going to do the bare bones of the job I'm asking them to do when they're getting paid to do it? So for me, it's really important. I, I go first to that cover letter. I look to see, do they have one? It's really funny to me, and, and so maybe a word of caution. Um, for some of these positions, we, require, we don't really require it for all, usually, um, but some of them we do. And we see a lot of people who will actually paste their resume into the spot meant for their cover letter. And to me, that's an automatic, like, I'm not moving forward with you. I, again, the cover letter does not have to be a novel. It doesn't have to be page after page, but I want to see something. Dear hiring manager, I recently saw your position for a maintenance technician posting, and it really piqued my interest. I love fixing things, and I would be honored to be part of your company. The end. Sincerely, Beth. I mean, it can be as simple as that. And if somebody can't take a few minutes to write a sentence or two, I'm not really sure that they're going to be that right fit for our company. Um, so I read that cover letter first and foremost. And then if I'm interested at that point, that's when I look at the resume. Um, and of course, everybody's different. And this is just one perspective for you. But the cover letter means so much to me. Um, well, but I look at that first and maybe won't even look at a resume unless I have a cover 
Beth, um, I'll jump in here. And kind of what I'm hearing is, is you're actually using that as a proxy for a culture fit. So yeah. what it really tells me is, is you're actually looking at culture as one of the most important critical first factors in any kind of application. And mm -hmm. so, you know, from a larger perspective, it's an interesting, I always tell people, right, there's uh, one of the three critical things that uh, in the hiring process is, are you going to fit in, right? And that's a that meaning that's a culture fit. And what you're saying is, is that's priority one for Excelsior Group. Mm -hmm. And for you is, is, is the fit there first, and then we'll look at your skills and qualifications. And I think that's, you know, that's, that's probably pretty rare to prioritize it that way. But I think it's a critical thing that everybody should know is, is that that is a critical factor is uh, that culture fit. And so I thank you for highlighting that. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you hit it right on the head, Alan, that the culture at the Excelsior Group, it's, it's what we hire towards. Um, those core values, you'll see them come out in multiple ways um, in our application process with the interview questions that we're asking. Uh, we now recently have started doing, um, it's basically a personality assessment, if you will, but our core values are so important. Um, one of them is about positivity. That is our, a core value. And we need to know that people are going to come into the Excelsior Group with a good attitude, that they are going to be friendly and kind. And we all have tough days. We all have challenges that we deal with. But are they going to come at it with a glass half full or a glass half empty approach? And so if, if they're able to do demonstrate our core values from the get-go, from the very beginning before we've ever had a chance to meet them, then that's going to be a really good reflection of who they could be for us in the long term and, and hopefully you know, be with us down the road. And, and it wouldn't just be a job, just something to, to break in a few bucks, but it could be a career, it could be a family that you're, you're joining, you could be really attuned to those different things that a company might be looking for. And Beth, I'd like to say when I work with my clients, I actually tell them to look at culture, their, their beliefs, their culture, and then to find a company that matches up with that mm -hmm. because there's going to be that passion there. There's going to be that connection. And, it, you know, I would say that there's a majority of the companies that I talk to and the hiring managers that they're, they're willing to, to kind of to, to bend the KSAs, not completely. You, you got to be in the ballpark, but people quite often will hire somebody on their passion for the culture and fudge on the KSAs. Yes, absolutely. I couldn't agree more, Scott. Um, I think that if we find the right person, then you know, the job is secondary. It really is. Um, and that's a message coming directly from our CEO, that we have to find the right people to maintain mm. our culture. And the job is secondary. I mean, a lot of these things, again, we talk about the hard skills and the soft skills. The hard skills are, are very easy to train. Okay, so you're not an Excel expert. Whatever, we'll get you there. Um, hopefully you at least have some technology basics. Uh, you can turn on a computer and, and you know, that'll get us somewhere. Um, hopefully we can teach you some of those other things, but you're not really always going to train on the culture. I mean, if somebody's not a positive person, are you really going to teach them to be positive? They might fake it for a while, but I mean, at, at the end, you're going to see who they are. And if they're not positive, that's, will come out eventually. If they're not um, humble, if they're not willing to take the initiative, I mean, we, our performance reviews are about our core values. We literally have mm. our core values ranked across the top and we reassign you a ranking. You're either a positive, meaning you demonstrate that consistently. You're a, a plus minus, meaning you occasionally or sometimes or periodically. And then you're a negative where you don't do it nearly enough and we need to do more of that. So it's a three-point scale with our core values right at the very top of our performance review because it's, it's who you are, the essence of who you are and you're demonstrating yourself to be. And if you can get that, then a lot of the rest of it just naturally comes in and we can work with you on those things. Um, and it's to the point with, with our company, again, we're, we're fairly small that if we have that right person. Sometimes we've created opportunities for people. Like you are just such a perfect culture fit we can't let go of you. We need to figure out a role. So let's maybe mishmash a few things and maybe it's kind of an odd uh, mixture of a job sometimes, but you know, as we've grown, things become a little bit more solid and we're able to zero in on their strengths and really make it a role that they're truly um, meant for. 
Um, but sometimes it's about finding that right fit for you and starting with that culture and the soft skills that make you part of it. So, uh, Scott, thank you for raising that up. I think that's a really good point. Um, I did see an, another question up here from Michelle um, asking about the email and if that would be adequate um, to be able to send in. And yes, I think the email itself, if that's the way a company is having you apply and submit your resume and, um, to them, I think the email itself could be a cover letter. Um, it's always, I mean, I, just to be certain, I think it couldn't hurt to basically put it into the email and then also have a PDF of that same message essentially, or maybe you'll say even in your email, like, you know, please reference my attached cover letter and resume. I'm excited about this opportunity and, and just have like a, a short introductory sentence. But I think that email absolutely could be your cover letter in a couple of short sentences or a couple of short paragraphs, and that would be perfectly sufficient. And um, Scott, yes, yeah, so I, I don't know why I didn't even put that on my, um, my contact page, but we're on excelsiorllc.com. And then if you do forward slash careers, that will take you right to our careers page and you can see our core values. We have a nice video on there as well, just an intro uh, for anybody who's in, um, interested in ever becoming one of our employees. And it talks about, again, our core values, <laughs> who we are, what we're about, um, the dynamics. You'll see very little about the jobs people are doing and more about how we interact with one another and what's important to us as an organization and how that is lived out. So um, Excelsior, E-X-E-L-S-I-O-R, LLC.com. And then if you want to forward slash it, you can add careers at the end and learn more about us that way. So Ellen, you also had a question about if someone doesn't have the minimum qualification. I think we talked a little bit. Oh, let me put the address on there. Thank you, <laughs> Excelsior. Um, if we still consider them that cultural fit, if they don't have the minimum qualifications, and you know, to Scott's point, sometimes we um, will finesse um, if we really like somebody. Like right now, we're doing a number of interviews, and sometimes they're not the right fit for a certain job or a certain specific team, but we really like them. Um, maybe they're lacking a few things. Maybe they haven't done X, Y, Z. But what we'll do is if we don't have something right then and there, we'll just maintain that communication with them because again, it's that cultural piece for us that we want to gravitate towards. And if we find somebody who's really going to fit that, we want to find a home for them as much as we can. Now, most of the qualifications should probably be there, some of the basics. Um, again, those hard skills, we can finesse around a little bit more, but um, if we find somebody who has some of those things, maybe they don't have five years of accounting experience, but they've got two years and then they've got a little bit of some other stuff. I mean, a lot of times it comes down to how people are, are communicating it, right? Using that cover letter to say, I don't have those five years, but let me tell you what I do have. I've got these two years and then I also um, mentored at this school and I helped teach calculus or I mean, I'm just making all this up, but there are other ways outside of job experience that you can communicate certain skills that you've been able to attain, whether you've been a volunteer somewhere, whether um, you've just been taking classes. I love right now in this environment where so many people aren't employed right now, those people who are taking this as an opportunity to, to train themselves, to learn new skills, um, to educate themselves. I, I love hearing about the people who are um, taking some of the free online classes, people who are watching TED Talks and learning about everything under the sun, what interests them. This is now the time to take advantage of this free time, quote unquote, that you have and get some new skills, get some new perspectives. And you can talk about that in a cover letter or you could maybe even put it at the bottom of your resume, but you know, it doesn't tell the story about why you're doing it. Okay, dear so-and-so, I'm not currently um, employed, but I am taking advantage of this time to pursue some other interests that I have. I've been learning about this, that, and the other. And I think what I've learned recently might apply to your position or your company because of whatever. You know, I recently saw a TED talk about this. What do you think about that? Maybe posing some questions to them. There's a lot of things that you can do right now if you're, you're not employed that will talk about those things. 
other questions? I think I went through a few of the ones that were on here in the chat feed. I have a curiosity question. You kind of covered it a little bit, but I'm just wondering if you can explore more in depth as to how, uh, I understand the interest in veterans from a generic sense, right? Like, yes, they're hardworking, loyal, dependable, but I'm wondering how that journey went for Excelsior Group. Like how did, how did you guys come about having an interest or focus on hiring veterans? So we have a, a hard time finding great candidates sometimes. Um, multifamily is a different world. And people don't really think about multifamily. They think about banks yeah. and, and they think about accounting firms. And, you know, it's a lot of people don't know our career path. And so we sometimes have a hard time finding opportunities. And, you know, sure, we might post a job opportunity, but, you know, who knows what a leasing consultant is unless you know what a leasing consultant is. A lot of people aren't typing those words into their searches. And so we're just having a hard time getting the word out there. And so one of the initiatives that we've been trying to do is trying to figure out what different community groups are out there that maybe are underrepresented at the Excelsior group and that we want to see more of. And this is a broader topic and a much bigger thing yeah. than I'm able to do today. But you know, we really want to have a, a robust um, DNI, so that's diversity and inclusion initiative. And with that, I think sometimes people think of diversity as just being about race or the color of your skin, but it's so much more than that. Um, it really covers all the different types of protected classes, which the federal government has, has been adding more and the state of Minnesota has a lot. And those cover things like race, color, religion, sex, national origin, um, marital status, gender status, you know, sexual orientation, um, veteran status, disability status. Um, all of those different things really make for a robust workforce. And those are all things that we really want to be able to focus on and draw into our own PEG community. So we've been um, thinking about veterans for a long time and um, we haven't been able to really make those connections until now. So which I'm just really thankful for this opportunity to connect with all of you, uh, make you aware about who we are, but also being able to provide services to you. Um, I know that there's a lot of different ways that people come about information and come about tips and, and things. And, and I think that we have something to offer even just by way of having conversations like this, um, but also hoping that we might be able to get some additional people. Um, having reached out to you, Ellen, I discovered that we hired somebody here through that network I had mentioned. And so I was able to connect with him uh, recently and just talk more about that experience. Yep. And it was really wonderful to hear how we've been able to help each other along the way. So, um, to just kind of wrap that up, the whole veteran piece is just a, a community organization to help us with our, our DNI initiative. And something I think is really important, just naturally. And um, was able to, to lead us to you. And actually, this came about because I went to a career fair a year and a half ago. And I met this gentleman who totally fit our core values. He was fantastic. Um, he was for a maintenance supervisor position. Unfortunately, he got a job offer the same week that we were scheduling an interview with him and I can't fault him for taking it, <laughs> but I was super bummed that our timing was just a little bit off because he was so great and we had just stayed in contact. I reached out a couple times to see how his job has been going and he loves it, which is great, but <laughs> I was hoping to bring him in and um, he had mentioned that, hey, I have this this, uh, well, I'd ask, do you have any you know, other resources? Do you know anybody else who might be interested? And he had mentioned that there's this Eagle group and uh, wonderful veterans and their families. And he sent me the contact information. And so that's how I, ultimately this came to be. So again, it's just that power of the network. I, I met somebody who had this connection and I was able to get me in. Very cool. Thanks. Other great questions of uh, what it's like on the other side of the desk? And it doesn't have to be about cover letters. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give everybody a chance to get their questions in. Sure. James? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try one about resumes. Um, when, when, I'm, when I'm trying to, you know, I, I've gotten to the point where I know that I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to match 
you know, the, 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 the desired qualifications, you know, the, the preferred qualifications, uh, some items from the roles and responsibilities, and, and try, try and match those up and, and demonstrate those in the resume. Um, and, and, and I'm trying to do it in a way that I, that, all right, here's my question. When I'm doing that, how obvious should I be? Uh, you know, it, it seems to me sometimes that, that it almost, you get the feeling like you almost want to be, okay, here is proof that I know how to communicate well in writing. You know, I wrote a, a, a big, you know, anyhow, I wrote a lot in the, in the military. Um, here is an example of me as an effective communicator. Do you have any tips or recommendations for us on how we can make our qualifications as, as obvious as possible to that person who's reading through it without running the risk of, of insulting their intelligence, I guess. Good question. Um, you know, for me, I, I understand that perspective of not wanting to insult their intelligence, so to speak, but at the same time, I really appreciate it when people are very specific and clear and when they make the connection for me, because frankly, people who are recruiting, they spend, they have so much on their plate. They don't want to have to spend nine hours reading through something. They want you to get to the point. And, and frankly, that's part of what communicating is about, right? It's getting to the point. It's making a message very clear and very understandable for the person who's on the other end of things. And so without it being too much work, and sometimes it is a lot of work, but if you're able to make that comparison on your resume or in the cover letter, you're looking for this, I have this. You're looking for that, I have that. Make it specific, make it clear to them so they don't have to do the work of doing that transferable process on their end. Because if they're having to spend a lot of work thinking, okay, well, James did all these things and for them to have to think through, well, what does that actually mean? And could that apply? Like, that's not really their job, it's your job as the applicant to draw the comparison for them and make it obvious that you are that fit because you actually do have all those experiences or all the things that they're looking for, all of those KSAs and the soft skills and the hard skills that you've had. Um, so as much as you're able to do that, and, and again, it, it might require a little bit more work. It might require some personalization. Maybe resume A is different than resume B um, because you're, you're focusing in on different pieces that they might be looking for. But I think in the end, you might benefit from that. I mean, especially if you have a little extra time, so to speak, right now, um, it, it could be helpful to do that, to get into those details. And, and I've actually seen resumes where they almost have a column, you know, they've got like a little chart on there where here's your job requirement and here's what I do. You could make it as simple as that. I don't mind those, I don't hate them. Um, but I mean, it's, it's a way to be specific and you're making it clear for them, especially if it's not clear. And I think that's the point that I wanna make is that if it's not clear, you can make it clear for them. And if it requires a chart, oh well, or a cover letter to explain it, do that. That's great. I really appreciate the way that you put that. That helped me out a lot. Thank you. Okay, good. good. Chad or Mark, is there any questions that you guys have? Not for me, no, thank you. Not right now, no, thanks. Awesome. And um, Scott, you wrote a quick message in here about um, military communication being different than civilian correspondence. And, and I think you absolutely have a point. And I think that's where, you know, if I can be a resource to anybody and you want to talk through different things that you have done and to try and find some of the words that might fit a civilian job description better, I'm certainly glad to do that. Um, but I think that's where sometimes talking things out, um, you can paint that story you can paint that picture better of what it is you did. Um, you know, I, I do have some vets in my life, and so it's, it's good for me, too, to hear that, to be in an environment where I'm hearing some of the language. Because even if you think about different companies, you know, we have so many acronyms and different things at the Excelsior Group that somebody coming in and off the street is like, what? What are you talking about? Um, we were actually we're recruiting for a recruiter, and uh, it was funny because I put in the we have this interview guide that we have uh, a question about an ATS and the hiring manager just said, you know, she sent me a quick message like, what's an ATS? So even within my own department, she has no idea, but it's an applicant tracking system. 
Um, so we all have our own language that we're speaking. And so it's up to us as applicants to make it clear to the other person on what it is that we're trying to communicate. So sometimes that just means talking with a civilian like me and trying to explain something that we can maybe finesse the language a little bit or you know, spell something out if it is an acronym so that the other person might have a better sense of what it is we're trying to communicate. And Beth, you just mentioned the ATS system. And I just would like to point out that, um, that um, military uses different terminology like you brought up. And if it doesn't match up to what the ATS is looking for, we're gonna get missed. And so, uh, you know, once again, this, I, I'm a big believer in cover letters. I think that they personalize, um, resumes are data. Cover letters personalize the application. Um, but I just want people to understand that ATSs that are out there and it's the applicant's job to be able to present themselves in a way that meets the ATS requirements. Yes, absolutely. And every ATS is going to be different in what they're looking for. If you get into one of these larger companies, or you're trying to get into one of those larger companies, they might have other specific criteria than the next company over might. Um, our ATS, we really try not actually to use very many screeners um, because again, I think it comes down to the cultural piece and to the cover letter and the cover letter, you know, it, the tool that we have isn't able to get into those details and it doesn't, it doesn't do the, the keyword searches for us, which some ATS might. And so I think it's good to be mindful of the size of the organization that you're applying for and being just aware of some of the uh, applicant tracking systems that are out there. And if it's a bigger, broader, more well-known one, it may have some nitty gritty pieces that screen you out. Uh, we don't require, so how do I phrase it? We, we have a couple of screener questions, if you will, but we have set it up in such a way that your answer does not disqualify you. We set it up as a way as more just an informational tool for us as we're looking through resumes. We can have this at a glance of, okay, Mark, you know, said that he can't work weekends. Well, this position requires weekends, but I still might want to talk to Mark. I still might want to figure out more about who he is and what he has to offer um, because maybe we can work on an arrangement. Maybe he doesn't work every weekend. Maybe he'll work just one day periodically. Maybe we can have a conversation about it, but at least I have a starting point of where he's at and how he answered my questions. Um, right now we're looking for a recruiter, I mentioned, and you know, so we've got some specific questions on there. You know, do you have applicant tracking ex system experience? Um, do you have a certain bachelor's degree? If not, oh well. I mean, it just gives us that data point of what we're starting with so that we can then go to the conversation knowing a little bit already about somebody. But there are a lot of ATSs that if you don't have those things, then you're gone. You just disappear into that black hole. So every, every one is a little bit different and just being mindful that you might have to generate certain keywords so that if you go to a big, big company and they have an ATS set up to screen that way, that your keywords aren't missed and then you do get that opportunity to you know, maybe even get your, your face in front of somebody. Beth, I'm looking on, I don't see the recruiter on your website. Oh, there it is, multifamily re recruiter. Yeah, it's specifically multifamily recruiter. Okay, yeah. good. I have a referral I'm going to send this to. That's why I'm Excellent. asking. Excellent. I love that. <laughs> I, I was just thinking the same thing, Alan. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. <laughs> is there any other questions for Beth? No? Awesome. Well, if not, um, Mike, if you could stop the recording and then uh, we'll continue on with the next.